I run a company called uh, Dona HQ, which is like a low-code, no-code app development platform, uh, which basically helps uh, right from SMEs to large enterprises in building applications uh, and internal tools. So that's what we do at large, and we are like basically a SaaS-based platform. Be cool. I was uh, I was actually checking on your website. Well, first. I want to mention that like no code is is a huge trend. Uh, when did you started the company and what uh, motivated you to go into no code? So we uh, it's it's actually a 13 year old company, but uh, okay. we got into no code no code in 2019. Okay. And uh, you know our motivation was. We already had a platform for uh, developers, mm -hmm. uh, a platform for the developers to build applications, uh, but we wanted to make it like a drag and drop uh, to make it even easier for our customers. Okay, okay. That's, that's how we got into it, yeah. So you started in 2019. How many active clients do you have right now? More than, more than 75. Okay, more than seventy-five. That's that's pretty good. I was checking um, on on your pricing plans on the website. Um, how many percent go with like starter plan, and how many percent go with uh, business plan? Uh, just a second. So I I don't have the data handy with me right now, but yeah, I, I just thought this is uh like you know a SaaS sales podcast which is, I think, related to maybe I am always listening to more in the conversation. So I, I was not really sure, like, you know, what uh, what is this going to be about? So do you mind just give me a quick introduction about, like, you know, what exactly is going to happen in this call? Yeah, we're obviously going to discuss about sales. And to discuss about sales, we discuss about numbers, right? So I'm going to ask about how many meetings you generate if you've got a sales team, uh, what's your closing rate, and that's that's why it's like I want to know: Do you guys sell more of the starter or business plan? Yeah, we sell more uh, starter plan. Uh, Eighty twenty would be the skew right now. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That that's what I would have, have guessed too. Um, what mm -hmm. does your sales team look like? Do you have SDRs? Do you have account execs? Can you give me a better portrait? We're building one uh, right now. We have like uh, you know uh, a small SDR team, one person team, and then we have uh, two AEs at this point in time, uh, and then we are backed up by an agency to help us. Yeah. So that's, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. In terms of sales, like what I, I know you're you're working with an agency. Like, why would you wanna wanna build that internally vs um, outsourcing it fully to an agency. Mm, the reason being, like you know, we we initially did not have an SDR team, and we had mm -hmm. to build that entire process. Okay. Uh, so we did not want to really like you know waste time there and just get ourselves going. So mm -hmm. that was the reason uh, we outsource the SDR piece. But now we are building it inside. So okay. we still have not really quite there, but yeah, it's, it's work is in progress. Okay. And generally speaking, how many, well, you, I, I would guess you also use other channels, you use other advertising channels to drive traffic to your website. And that's uh, the main driver of subscription, right? Okay. That's correct. It's all and inside sales and yeah. And yeah. And like for the SDRs, would it, because the start, I don't think you'd put an SDR on the starter plan. Would it be for the business plan or what's your plan with that? Yeah, SDRs are meant for the business plan. That's correct. Okay, okay. And what kind of so, business, what, what kind of businesses would you target with that plan? Uh, typically mid-sized companies, uh, you know, uh, 100. 200 to 500 as a headcount, and we go after chasing like anywhere between 12 thousand dollar deal size to upwards of 25 thousand dollars kind of okay. deal sizes. Yeah. And do you target any verticals? Uh, for example, like do you target marketing agencies? Do you target uh, what type of niche do you target? Um, so right now we 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 target internet companies and e-commerce companies. Okay. 
Um, can you guide me as per why an e-commerce company would be interested in a, a no-code tool? Yeah, so uh, e-commerce companies are heavy on operations uh, mm -hmm. and do, you know, both on the customer success side of things, uh, mm -hmm. fulfillment and the delivery side of things. Uh, mm -hmm. They're pretty, uh, you know, they run pretty uh, huge operations if they're if they're large companies. So mm -hmm. yeah, that those are the reasons why we target them and they always have needs to become operationally more efficient. And that's why, uh, you know, they, they would care about no-code tools. Okay, okay. Um, coming back to your SDR structure, your, your sales structure, like you want to have account managers too? Do you already have account managers? Yes, we already have account managers, but, uh, you know, okay. we if, if we grow, we will grow that team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, that's, that's pretty interesting. So, okay, we have around 12 uh, minutes left. So I'm going to try to shift like to a, a more personal side of things, like who you are as an entrepreneur, uh, Jinan, and like how you uh, became what you became and how, how you forged your company. So I'm going to ask a couple of rapid fire questions and you can answer me a quick answer so that we have enough time in the, the 10 minutes left now. So um, I was wondering about, and it, that your answers can be business and personals. And for us entrepreneurs, I guess we kind of mix both. So what were your greatest losses in 2020 and 2021? What, what lessons did you learn from them? And then you can proceed yeah. telling us like what your greatest wins were. Sure. So uh, Charles, I think uh, one of the big thing uh, that uh, like, you know, which was a learning for me is to increase your sales and to go on a hyper growth journey. You need okay. to have amazing tools. You mm -hmm. need to have a very well oiled engine, to, you know, just your lead to a win process. Right. So, yeah. and you need to really make sure that, you know, you're working on every step in your funnel uh, and ensuring that, you know, you are able to progress the leads from, Mm -hmm. stage one to stage two in, in a very, very efficient manner, right? Indeed. So I think, uh, you know, that, that's something like, you know, we, we really learned it, uh, you know, especially when we started working on our SaaS journey because uh, the number of users kind of really uh, that we were dealing with, the number of leads that we were dealing with kind of balloon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that, that really caused us to really relook at it. And yeah. then uh, since we ourselves are a low-code, no-code tool, Charles, uh, mm -hmm. the biggest benefit that we got is we kind of like, you know, do, I mean, like, you know, we use the product in-house and mm -hmm. today probably in probably uh, four quarters, right, we have an extremely amazing, uh, you know, systems wherein mm -hmm. every step of the funnel, we are actually uh, a sales team uh, would be in a complete control over the lead. Uh, sure. They would understand what the lead has done while they were like, you know, not really interacting with them uh, mm -hmm. on the website, on the platform. And then while uh, what, what has the marketing tech uh, or, or marketing automation has done to engage mm -hmm. the lead and so on and so forth. So, you know, everything is assembled at one place. And then uh, for the sales reps, all that they need, really need to do is send them a, a subscription order form or maybe send them a proposal or, you know, do things, everything is automated. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's the best part of having a very well-oiled uh, machinery. Uh, hmm. You know, I mean, like, you know, we used to use tools like Pipedrive earlier, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. you know, they could, they were just good enough to take us only to, you know, uh, not fully really automate things and mm -hmm. no code really helped us do it extremely fast. And okay. today we have like, you know, full-fledged things where in, uh, even extensions or, you know, Chrome extensions, et cetera, like you know, have been created. So mm -hmm. enabling the sales guys to do a lot of things faster. Okay. So let me get that right. Because me on my side, for example, I tend to use HubSpot, like to track my pipeline and automate pretty much everything. I connect stuff with Zapier. So it's like my glue between apps. Um, what what do you use on your side? Do you use combination of Zapier? Do you use like even your own tools? Like, uh, can you give me a better picture of that? 
Yes. So uh, for us, our marketing funnel starts right from, uh, you know, a visitor visits a website. Mm-hmm. So we track everything, what's happening on our website, and we put it back into our sales uh, CRM, uh, mm-hmm. which is our, like, you know, based on no code, low code. So mm-hmm. that's one, that's, that's where we start tracking things. And that's where we start uh, building a user persona within our system. Uh, mm-hmm. Then uh, as a next step in our funnel is if you want to come on our website, you like what we do, then you sign up. Right from mm-hmm. the moment you sign up, we also now get more details about you. So we mm-hmm. kind of map it across back again in our CRM. And then, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's, that's again, that's something that happens, right? And the okay. moment you sign up, there are like, you know, ton of automation that gets uh, to engage the user, right? Because mm-hmm. now we are dealing with volume. We are like, you know, about, about uh, uh, you imagine like, you know, more than thousand uh, people on a monthly basis uh, subscribe on a platform, right? Uh, for mm-hmm. a free trial. And then, uh, you know, uh, we got to help them, right? And we can't really do it in, uh, with putting uh, humans behind this job, right? Correct, so correct. what we do is then we, we, when we have these personas, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Then what we also do is uh, what they do on the platform, uh, like, you know, let's assume you build a few things within the platform then we even grab that and basis that like you know we form our communication and that also like you know starts engaging the user in that format for example you are a, uh, there are two personas you are using the platform really well in that case you might have uh, you know uh, things like uh, you know are, are you getting stuck somewhere do you need uh, you know support etc those are the kind of messages that we send out or how do you do better on our platform and let's assume if you are not really like, you know, using it well, then we kind of like, you know, tell them, hey, would you want to join us for some co-building sessions, right? So we have more, much more smarter communication happening. Again, thanks to our platform, we could really like, you know, build all these automations really faster, right? Okay. If, uh, in our case, we completely do only on, only on Rona HQ because we do not really need any of those things, right? No mm-hmm. Zapier, et cetera. While... Uh, the calling system right now, like, you know, we work on with AWS SQS, uh, the, the call center solution that we use. So that is where we need Zapier because we do not straight away connect to AWS SQS at this point in time. But yeah, that's bearing that thing. Entire process is currently running purely on Tona HQ and it's, it's, it's running wonderfully for us. Okay, pretty cool. Um, I want to ask you, at what time do you get up and at what time do you go to bed? Oh, wow. That's a great question. So I start my day like at seven in the morning, Charles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, like, you know, I, I try to spend some time. Uh, I do a little bit of practice, a little bit of yoga early in the, yeah. in the morning just to get mm-hmm. myself like, you know, in the right, uh, in the positive, uh, you know, in the positive frame of mind. Nice and then I... Basically, like, you know, I wind up my day by, uh, my, my work day starts at probably like, you know, around uh, 9, 9 a.m. And okay. then, uh, then I take a couple of breaks in, in, in my daytime because uh, my majority of my customers are in the U.S. So I don't really need to like, do a lot much uh, mm-hmm. during the daytime. So I spend mm-hmm. some time with my, my, my family and then mm-hmm. my evenings are uh, like, you know, are again back in the, with customers. So I wind up my day by around 8 p.m. and then head off for uh, some sports. So we, I, I hit my club, play some sports and then mm-hmm. dinner and then like, you know, hit bed by around 11 in the night. So mm-hmm. that's, that's my schedule generally. What sports do you do generally? Uh, so uh, we, I, I play ping pong. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I play chess. I Pretty also cool. play. Uh, yeah, I also play. Like you know, in India there's a game called cricket. I'm not yep. sure whether you've heard about cricket. Yes, yeah, so yes, I play cricket obviously. as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I have Indian yeah, employees, so I, I I do know cricket. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Wow, that's cool. Right? So I do play like you know all these things, and then. Uh, right now, our clubhouse basically shut because of pandemic here. Mm. So, you know, otherwise badminton and squash are the other things that we generally play. So we have like one day for squash on a weekly basis, three days for, you know, for a ping pong. And that's, that's typically like, you know, how we uh, schedule sporting things. That's pretty cool. So whenever I come to India, like where are you based in India precisely? Uh, do you know? Uh, okay. Uh, there's a city in uh, India, Mumbai. So that's where I'm based. 
Okay, okay, yeah, Mumbai, obviously. Whenever I come to Mumbai, we need to go play ping pong, squash, and yeah, probably badminton. Badminton, I used to be really good, um, but yeah. I'm not okay. I'm not right now. Uh, squash, I am still very, well, not very good, but like eight on 10 good, and ping pong, you'd probably beat me. Um, and then, then, then we'd have to finish <laughs> off with uh, a game of chess. Uh, chess, oh, I'm wow. like, I'm like eight on 10, but compared to Indian player, that might be like a six on 10 because the other day I played against the daughter of one of my um, Indian employee. Her name is Shravani. She's amazing. And her daughter like beat me in five minutes. So. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. So, you know, uh, wow. You come to India, we definitely play. Otherwise I'm coming to Canada very soon. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even in Canada right now. I'm in Oaxaca, Mexico. I, I travel a lot, but uh, yeah, whenever you come to Canada, Montreal, when, whenever you want to freeze yourself up up there, uh, you tell me and uh, I'll organize something. Oh, excellent. Amazing. Nice. All right. Oh, I, wow. I, I have a couple more questions for you. Like you told me about yoga. That's interesting. What other habits do you have to create energy in your life so i i spend a lot of my weekends at this point in time to you know make our systems better make our because like you know we are low code no code tool mm -hmm. and one of the really things that we kind of like you know uh, do is we practice what we are actually like, you know giving out in the, to the customers right so mm -hmm. that that really gets us uh, like you know a is uh, understand how the product mm -hmm. can get better, what is it that, you know, the end users might be facing issues. So those are the things that we try to internalize. A lot of these things uh, is what we do. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, like it's, a, it's practice across our organization. So if you are in customer success, find some things which you can automate and make yourself 10x, uh, you know, in, in that aura, right? So that's, that's still something that we do, uh, Charles. What tip do you have to create a great company culture? Well, uh, just be a nice human, I think. Uh, you know, that's, that's one thing that you could do because people want to work with nice people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, nice people generally creates a better culture, a uh, mm -hmm. more positive culture, just be honest. And I think, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing. And, you know, personally, I feel... Uh, you know, if you are a person that, you know, you'd like to work more with uh, uh, nicer people than, and, and smarter people, then, you know, you make sure that you just look for those kind of people that you can work with that will really ease out yourself, uh, not really get too much stress about what people are doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, you know, as a team, you will shine. That's, that's what I feel. Like, you know, just work with nicer and smarter people. That's and how do you make sure that your team is not too stressed? How do you decompress them? How do you make them feel at ease? Well, uh, in, in my case, typically, like, you know, um, I, 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 I believe my job is to coach them. My job is to ensure mm -hmm. that they are successful. And mm -hmm. if they are not really doing uh, well, then it's something that I'm not doing well. So that's my approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try to... Make sure that you know uh, they, they get all the all the, all the possible help that they really mm -hmm. need to ensure that they are shining at the job, right? Okay. So okay. that's something I do. And then if I feel that they are too stressed, or uh, we have a very pretty much like a flexi uh, setup here, so mm -hmm. you know, it's a simple thing. You just take a day off, right? Okay. Or you take a week off. So that's that's something that you know we we that's how I I run my uh, my organization and your your salespeople say your accounts manager how do you make sure that they stay motivated more in radar motivated so uh one thing that i understand in sales is all about like you know they they're hitting their quota they're getting correct their, you know they're making their incentives Mm -hmm. So my job is simple. I just want to make sure that they make money, right? And yep. if, I, if I do that, then you know, <laughs> they, they, they feel good. They, they, good one. Then my second job is like, you know, I need, to, I need to somehow make sure that there is enough velocity 
So okay. uh, I'll give an example. One of my like you know very recently like you know we had a, a problem uh, in in our team that you know we were not really generating enough conversation uh, mm. with a couple of people, right? And um, talking about like you know about my agency and my internal team, right? So yeah. um, you know, it's, and then what really happened is like you know we really. Uh, uh, we try to solve this problem by resorting to some sort of automation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, something like oh, we we were always very keen to adopt uh, something like outreach or a sales mm-hmm. lock and mm-hmm. automate sort of stuff. Yeah. And that really, like you know, once we implemented something like that, right? We we saw that our conversations were going up, our and eventually, like you know, people uh, were really enjoying because they were getting conversations, they were meeting newer people, and they were solving real problems. So, you know, that's that's mm-hmm. something that really, like you know, at the end of the day, just make sure that you know you are enabling your people to achieve their goals. And I think the rest of the things should can be taken care of. Yeah, yeah, I do agree with that. Okay, final two questions. Um, what are your top three books right now? Can be personal, can be business. What are your top three books that you would recommend to my audience? Uh, one of the things that I recently read was uh, uh, Sales Accelerate Predictable Revenue. Yeah. Uh, now that's Aaron a book Ross. by yes. So you amazing know that, that really like you know oh, it, it's it's amazing because it oh, kind yeah. of deconstructs the whole process and methodology mm-hmm. if you're building a sales organization then i would recommend you to read that book yep. uh, there's another book by uh, you know the hubspot guy and I'm, I'm kind of missing it's missing the name but it's like sales disrupt- acceleration uh yeah yeah okay the one by uh Roberts, right yeah I'll, I'll just get you the name because it's just uh, there in my book list so you know it's, it's the sales acceleration formula by sales Michael acceleration Rich. formula yeah that's correct right so yeah, sales acceleration good formula so really that's, good one that's again a good one because it talks about how do you build culture how do you hire right people correct. and things around there so it's, mm-hmm. it's it's a great book uh sure. i personally love math so you know uh, uh i i i recently like you know reading this book in finite powers and and that's that's really amazing but you know okay. uh if you ask me my top three books i one of the books that has really like you know really had an impact on me is a book by jack welch okay. uh so that's that's something like you know that's that's something which i would Again, I'm, I'm bad with my names at this point in time. No, it's fine. But, I have yeah. Google to help you. So the, the first one, the first one is quite interesting. I'll take a note of it. Infinite powers: How calculus reveals the universe. That's super duper interesting, and I'll I'll certainly put it in my list because I do love maths and science. I'm a nerd too, so I'll I'll put it wow. on my list. Um, and for Jack Welch, would it be like Winning by Susie and Jack Welch? Yes, the okay. Winning. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. I'll put yeah. it on my list too. What did yeah. you like about the that last book, Winning? One of the things that, like, you know, Jack Welch, uh, you know, he, he just uh, deconstructed the entire principle on how do you okay. build great organizations and how do you, okay. like, you know, really make, uh, uh, how did he basically, like, you know, take uh, General Electric to from maybe a $5 billion to $100 billion company. And in his journey, mm-hmm. how did he really like, you know, put so much emphasis on people and how did he really go about doing that, right? Okay. So, so that, that, was a, that was a great book to read. Hmm. Pretty interesting. I think there's a new one, um, a new book about General Electric. Uh, this one is, is a bit uh, less positive. Uh, it's called uh, Light Out. And it's Pride Delusion and the Fall of General Electric <laughs> by, by its previous okay. CEO that did not do um, that. Well, I, I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not always one person. Um, but yeah, this guy didn't like possibly do the best of jobs at, at um, General Electric. The, the, the stock fell a lot. Uh-huh. And um, 
I think uh, his name, yeah, Jeff Imlet. Jeff Imelt, sorry. That's the, the last ah, okay. um, CEO of General Electric that preceded Welsh. And and yeah, sure. but I'll certainly check it. Um, okay, so you, you name you name Jack Welsh. Is, is he like one of your favorite CEOs? Would you have like CEOs you would recommend us that you that you admire or that you follow? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes, I, uh, yeah, Jack Welch, because I, I really read him, like, you know, probably about 10 years back. So mm -hmm. I, I really, it, I mean, like, you know, I was really inspired by the way he built his organization. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, he did not, uh, his story is not about building things grounds up, but mm -hmm. more about, like, you know, when you are in charge of a $5 billion mammoth organization, how do you take it to $100 billion? So it was it was pretty exciting. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, some of the people that have really like you know put they they have they have been inspirational are uh, maybe somebody like Larry Ellison. Uh, yep. I have read him a, a little bit as well. Uh, in fact, quite a lot. So that's that's again a very inspirational thing. Uh, Why Larry Ellison and not uh, Sergey Brin? Uh, Larry Ellison and not Sergi Brin. I'm not really read Sergi Brin, but I've read Larry Ellison. And I think, uh, like, you know, how he really, like, you know, one of the videos that I saw about Larry uh, probably in the in early 90s when mm -hmm. internet was not a big thing. And mm -hmm. how did he really, like, you know, he actually went on stage and say, this is going to be the next big thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Oracle was a big competition to Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. And he went about saying like, you know, you know, uh, Microsoft does uh, local things and small things well. We, we mm -hmm. do centralized and big things well. And, yeah. you know, internet is the thing. Things are going to get centralized. And this was like, you know, early 90s. Um, yeah. Nobody would have really like this, uh, would have seen it. And I, I believe mm -hmm. he was a true visionary. So, mm -hmm. I, and then and that, that really got me into like, you know, reading more about him. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, Larry Ellison is a very inspiring uh, person for me personally. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I, no. I think like I don't know why, but my brain like made the mistake. I I, I think my brain thought uh, you were saying Larry Page, but yeah, okay, Larry Ellison, founder of uh, of Oracle. Um, I started his his bio, but I I kind of got bored, you know. Um, there was a, a bio made by him, but yeah, I guess he's a he's a visionary. Um, he's in the top 10 like richest tech people with like a net worth of like a hundred billion, which is crazy. And that, yeah, like he, he's a special guy too. Like, I don't know if you know that he collects, you know, samurais and he has this, um, yep. this, this mega mansion built, uh, on Japanese style architecture houses in, in yep. California. So <laughs> it's kind of a special type, <laughs> but yeah, go on with your favorite CEOs. That's a cool one. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, aside the you know the kind of uh, wealth that he has uh, amassed or kind mm -hmm. of things that he owns possesses, mm -hmm. uh, that's 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 okay for me. But what what's important is like you know, uh, see, I, I our business is very similar. We are into the tech business. We we are mm -hmm. into development tooling business, right? So mm -hmm. we kind of like, you know, uh, when, when we look at companies like Oracle, we look at companies into entire uh, development stack kind of companies. They are, mm -hmm. they are really inspirational for us because, you know, mm -hmm. when we are building a development tooling ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's 7 billion is a huge, it's a huge world, right? I mean, you look exactly. at it from, and then how do you really like, you know, make your mark? How do you really... Uh, project your voice and like you know make sure that it reaches at some level and it's not really get lost in the noise right so mm. those are the things that you really got to uh, do to ensure like uh, you inspire yourself by looking at the right people right we've been there the, done that the wikipedia page of larry ellison and like i have a theory about like really really successful people and i, I guess it's a theory shared by many experts but they've got a chip on their shoulder a, a huge chip on their shoulder actually which means that they have something to prove um and generally that is because something happened during their childhood right and the 
the his Wikipedia begins like with really striking lines. So let me read you that before we we end the podcast because this is quite interesting. So Larry Ellison was born in New York City to a non-wed Jewish mother. His biological father was an Italian American United States Army Air Corps pilot. After Ellison contracted pneumonia at the age of nine months, his mother gave him to her aunt, to her aunt and her uncle for adoption. He did not meet his biological mother again until he was 48. That's that's really powerful, no? Absolutely. That's and a, uh, there is one more on interesting thing about Larry, right? Just to okay. add, right? So yeah. there is a Larry uh, infamously made a Genghis Khan quote for pretty famous. He says, okay. uh, it's not important to be successful. He says, he goes on to say, it's not just important to be successful, but everyone else must fail. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's that's mm-hmm. pretty much like, you know, uh, there's this book uh, which is authored by I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the person, but there's a book with a title. Right. Everyone else must fail. So that that's, oh that's how cutthroat is Larry Ellison when it comes to like, you know, ensuring. I mean, I'm sure like, you know, you whatever, whatever he must have done when it came must have come across Microsoft when he was building his database business. Uh, maybe that's that's the prophecy by which he ran and uh, how we really built it big. But uh, whatever, mm. that's 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 if, if you Google further, that's what you would read about him and how mm. he has literally made that Genghis Khan quote pretty. I mean, infamously, like you know, you might associate in our age with say maybe Larry Hales. Right? It's really so, yeah. well. It's it's quite it's quite drastic and and yeah, I, I kind of it's kind of a cutthroat market and that's probably why he. He did good inside it, you know, and, and and another another striking thing here. I don't know why, and I don't know if you know, but um, John McAfee, the founder of McAfee, recently died. Yeah, yeah, and, yes, in the jail. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Larry Ellison somehow makes me think of him, like from from his physical features, but also he kind of shares the same mm. um, cutthroat philosophy, which which you know I tend to not agree with well i mean the, the guy gave back right he he he's big in philanthropy but did he do it really from a good place or just did he do it because everyone else was doing it or because he want for for public perspective for perception you know um but anyway he, he's an interesting guy and he obviously has a lot to to teach so any any one sentence or any lesson you would like to leave our audience with before we go? Uh, for now, I, I think, uh, you know, the world is a crazy place. Uh, yep. What I feel is like, you know, in, just by making sure you're following your passion is, is mm-hmm. the most important thing that would really help you mm-hmm. uh, get to probably where you really want to be, right? So yeah. One thing that, that I have personally like, you know, really benefited is by just doing things, focusing on doing things that has made me happy. And I think, I think eventually like, you know, that well, probably that's, that's the, that's the thing that has really helped me be where I am at this point. So play more ping pong people stuff. Sorry. Play more ping pong people. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, whatever that makes you happy, man. Happier you makes some more wonderful things. So you know, sure. <laughs> let me put it that way. Sure, and, that's so, a that's yeah. a really good lesson that people tend to forget. So hey, uh, thank you so much for for being here, Jinan. I know it's been uh, a bit complicated to get here, but uh, I think we we had great conversation. We shared great lessons, and for the rest, uh, we'll we'll be in touch. Wishing you a, a wonderful day, my my friend. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Amazing talking to you as well. And yeah, I look forward to like, seeing what you Thank do. Thank you, Jen. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye.